Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, from Massachusetts Families Organizing for Change. My name is Radhika. I will be facilitating the webinar. Uh, I want to thank you all for making time to join us uh, today, making uh, a little bit of extra time from your busy schedule. So appreciate that. Um, I want to introduce our guest today, is, uh, who is San Sandra Heller. She is the co-chair of Massachusetts Families Organizing for Change, or MFOFC. But before we get to the webinar itself, a few housekeeping items. Uh, you will notice that um, almost all of you are muted upon entry. Um, this is to minimize the disruption and, and background noises. So um, I also noticed that a couple of you I'm not able to mute. So if you can do me a favor and mute yourselves, I would really appreciate that um, so that we can all um, hear Sandy when she speaks. Um, the other thing is if you're having trouble with connectivity, I recommend uh, logging out and then even logging out of your browser and logging back in. Um, that might help. Also using earphones helps. Um, we are planning about 40 minutes of conversation with Sandy followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of uh, hopefully we'll have time left over for a Q&A from you. Um, if you have questions that are coming up in your minds as we go through the webinar, I recommend using the chat box. You will see the chat box or the chat uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so just type your question into the chat box and uh, we will um, address the questions um, based on the time we have available. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, we, we are recording the webinar, so we're planning to have this webinar available after, uh, at a later date once the recording is complete. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I want to get started. Uh, welcome to Sandy and thank you Sandy for making time today um, for the webinar and I want to thank MFOFC for this opportunity to share uh, your views and share your views and insights with the uh, with the families in our state um, and welcome again everyone um, Sandra Heller is a mom to three adult children one of whom is Craig uh, who has Down syndrome and uh, he he is part of the topic of our conversation today so uh, she will talk about Craig's and her journey her family's journey um, in um, in coming up with uh, in designing a, a living arrangement that works for Craig. Um, Sandy brings considerable personal and professional experience uh, helping individuals with uh, special needs. Um, she is the associate executive director of Namaskit Group and the director of Family Connections. Um, she became involved with MFOFC over 20 years ago and is currently the co-chair of the organization. So Sandy, welcome again and um, looking forward to you uh, hearing from you today. So let's start with uh, why don't you just go ahead and add more context about your background and tell us more about Craig and his background, uh, his strengths and challenges. Hi, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about my family and then the journey we've had and hopefully people are able to get some information on their journey. Um, I am a mom. I live in Marion, Mass, down in the southeastern part of Massachusetts. Um, uh, Craig is my oldest son. He is 32 years old. I have a daughter who is 30 and a, another daughter who is 25 going on 26. And my journey started out very, very early. I want to say it really started out probably right back when, uh, you know, Craig was born. You know, it was an unexpected uh, surprise at birth that he did have Down syndrome. And, you know, there was a struggle like anyone has a struggle of mm -hmm. what the future will hold. And I knew right from the beginning that his future would be as typical as anyone else. It was a belief that I've always had and I've always shared. And it's given him the opportunity to really have what I call uh, a wonderful life with full of experiences and a journey that we continue to go down. So um, again, uh, thank you. Um, so Sandy, tell us a little bit more about Craig's, um, what are his strengths 
and what does he struggle with right now? Sure. So some of the, uh, the uh, strengths that Craig has is personality. His personality, his resilience in life, you know, we've had a journey that has taken us in different paths through the years. When he was uh, first a young child, he was fully included um, right from preschool all the way through his up to um, leaving the high school years. But during that journey, we had a little distraction with his health. I would say that in um, uh, when he first went into what's called middle school, he uh, uh, became very ill and as a result of the illness, um, ended up having a trichostomy. And for uh, six years, you know, he did not have any um, airway to his vocal cords, so he had no speech. Mm -hmm. He required one-to-one -one nursing. Um, we were at Mass General uh, at least every eight weeks. He was hospitalized on and off. He had numerous uh, surgery complications. But throughout that journey, our vision never changed. Mm. And when I mentioned that, it's so important that the vision that we began when he was younger, that he would have a typical life like everyone else, it never changed because mm. we had that vision. Even with all the obstacles that came about with his medical needs, we were still able to follow that journey. It, we might have had to take a few days off when we were in the hospital, but we knew right when we came back that he would be fully included, um, that uh, he would require nursing, but that didn't mean that he still couldn't be included with the other students. So he missed and a some of the strengths that Craig, oh, yeah. um, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I was just making sure. Uh, so he was able to still continue school during that time or? He or, did, yeah, okay. you know, again, it, there was a, a little bit more planning, hmm. a little bit more, how are we going to do some these steps? with his vision and which I will uh, include in the net in the next slide. This is Craig. Craig is 32 year old man and he currently is living in Fairhaven, Mass. As you can see, he does not have a trachostomy any longer. He did have a successful reconstructive surgery for the second time, the first time it failed when he was 18 going on 19. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, not that he's completely out of the woods for everything. We, of course, keep an eye on his medical needs, right. but he has come a long ways um, in his journey of what he wants for a vision in his life. Mm. So some of his strengths, I would say, is right there, that smile, you know, that smile and that ability to continue going no matter what right. obstacles come across um, makes us as a family uh, so proud and, and so honored to be part of his life. And I say that now truthfully, that being honored to be part of his life because he is a grown man that makes mm -hmm. his decisions. We, of course, will give him more information, more assistance when necessary, but I believe that he is a man uh, of his own being and I can't make him do anything, nor would I want to. He needs awesome. to up. up um, a man on his own journey. Awesome. Um, so uh, what are some of his, what does he need support with right now? Or maybe what we can do is then just before we get to that, maybe tell us his life right now. Um, he's employed. Um, so paint us a picture about that and his living so, arrangement, obviously. Sure. Uh, you know, Craig had a vision early on that we followed and this vision can be done at different stages in life. Um, this is something that was developed from the age of probably, uh, I would say probably about eight years old, of all the ways up until current. Mm -hmm. And that vision was a typical life that everyone else has. And, you know, it was spending time um, on vacations. It was doing uh, things of its interest. Uh, going to dances, going and singing and drumming. He's always been a very musical kind of guy. Um, so that vision has enabled him to be who he is today. He currently lives in a, a home in Fairhaven. It, um, he does have a roommate. His roommate is a, uh, a gentleman in his early 50s. Um, they have a home and that home is actually a two floor home. Mm -hmm. And uh, his roommate has sort of the, the first floor 
and Craig has the second floor where he has a, his own uh, bedroom, bath, and what we call his man cave. And he spends a lot of time in his man cave when he's home, like I do when I'm home. I have, I would say I don't have a man cave, but I do have a, an area that I, I frequent and have my own time and space. Mm -hmm. He is, um, he goes out into uh, different things in the community on a daily basis. He works for a, uh, a local family owned furniture slash supplies, different things that they sell in their store. Mm -hmm. um, called the original Bob's not confused with the Bob's furniture, but the original Bob's mm -hmm. and um, he works uh, roughly two to three days a week. I would, again, uh, three to four hours on each one of those days. Uh, he does have support. You know, mm -hmm. he has somebody that supports him in his job. He has people that support him in his home. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, takes music lessons. He's taking now guitar lessons. He uh, the local gym. He has a personal trainer. And of course, like everyone else, as being living in your own home, he has responsibilities such as shopping, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, cleaning Paying the bills. Of course, uh, you mm -hmm. name it, he has to do it. Yeah. And of course, with the, the weather, when it's warmer out, he frequents his neighborhood. The It's an amazing location where his home is. It's a part of a sort of a village. Mm -hmm. And across the street is the library and the post office. Around the corner is the town hall. Along the, um, uh, within, you know, one block, there are numerous small restaurants, stores, uh, convenience stores, and so forth. So he has a neighborhood that's full of life. Awesome. Um, every summertime, every Thursday night, there's a concert in front of the town hall that's free. And he literally just has to walk out his front door to hear, hear the music. So it, it's given him so many wonderful opportunities to have his own home. That's great. Um, so for how long has he been in this, in this, um, this is a single family home, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. And, and uh, this particular living arrangement and the job for how long has he been in both? He has uh, lived in this home for seven years. Um, he, before living in that home, we were working on, again, his vision of what he wanted to do in the future was eventually living by himself. Mm -hmm. had that vision for many, many years. I apologize for this slide. It's a little bit blurry, but this is his person-centered planning uh, visions that he's had. And this included very much working, living on his own. Um, you know, having the normal things that we all do, you know, going to events and concerts and um, uh, different uh, music things and so forth. Um, and he's been able to accomplish all that. So the work is something he's been actively employed for at this location going on, I think, six years. Mm -hmm. And before that, he's had numerous jobs that he's been trying and doing since the age of 16. Um, and that's a key thing, uh, you know, I know with many of our children, and Craig is not unique in this way, he's had to actually experience things to know what he likes and doesn't. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, do you want to live in an apartment um, and envision that as we can sometimes, but for Craig, he actually has to live in that apartment to try it, mm -hmm. to know whether he likes it or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, a key for my son, and I'm sure for many other families, would be giving them the opportunity, whether it's working, whether it's living, whether it's doing recreational um, activities, going on vacation, he actually has to experience and do it to know what he likes and doesn't. So he, did I hear you right? So the work has been for the past six years, the current job, and the living arrangement for seven years? Yes. Okay. So tell us then a little bit more about how you got to this, the, the process of getting to this point of living arrangement. Um, you know, how many, like how many tries did you, did it take, you know, uh, what kind of resources did you have to leverage? It really started out when he was um, 14. Mm. I started doing a lot of the planning. And I say this for many of the families, again, out there with uh, uh, younger children, and you're looking at transition age. Yes. I don't think it's ever too young to start looking and thinking about the future. 
Um, and again, Craig is no different than everyone else. Um, he's had to experience different things. And this is one way we've achieved this is going through uh, his vision and having him try out different things. Mm -hmm. Age of 14 being a young man in the school system, we focused a lot on giving him opportunities to experience anything from uh, spending time at other people's homes. And, uh, and I say that he had a, uh, he had a um, staff member that he had as a, uh, uh, in his school, who uh, befriended him and became very close to him. And she invited him to spend Tuesday nights um, with her and her, her, her uh, boyfriend at the time. And that grew into an overnight over the years where it was his experience to be away from us for at least one night a week. Mm -hmm. To this day, he still does that on Tuesday nights with mm -hmm. her family, even though he does have his own place to live. Um, it's something that they both look forward to. It's given them a relationship. It's helped in his vision for the future because again, none of us are gonna be here forever. Mm -hmm. And part of a vision, I think, for um, many of our loved ones is not only where he wants to be, but who's going to be there and who's going to help him get there. Mm -hmm. And it can't just be mom and dad. And it can't just be his sisters. Mm -hmm. It'll be other people that, you know, he has in his life beyond his immediate family. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very happy to see that he has that. And so at the age of 14, we focused on his individual education plan on how to give him the opportunity to work, to try out different jobs, um, to be able to spend time with other people besides his family, um, to work on his interests. And through that, as I said earlier, at the age of 16 is when he did most of his exploration of trial of work. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, he tried he, uh, working in a restaurant. He tried working in an office. He tried working um, at a zoo. Uh, he tried working in childcare. He does not like childcare. <laughs> um, he tried and he did very well at a uh, position called, um, it's called Lockheed Martin. And in that position at the age of 16, he was, um, they developed government, secret government um, um, equipment, missiles, so forth. They have um, these companies throughout the world. And again, through um, our networking with friends, we were able to have a, uh, a, a close friend of mine that had worked, made a connection for us to go in to have Craig obtain a job there. And he was a uh, duplicating operator for about four years. Hmm. Um, and I would say that that was the most successful job mm -hmm. um, for him, even with having a one-to-one -one nurse at that time. Awesome. It gave him a lot of opportunity to experience what it's like to be a worker. Hmm. And through, through that time, he was obviously living with you still, right? He was. He and was. Okay, so then when did you begin that process of trying out new living arrangements, housing and stuff? Uh, we really started at the age of before 22. So, you know, from 14, we, we worked with the school. At 18, like every other uh, person that was a quote senior in high school, he was done with high school. And so he uh, finished out, he went through the graduation ceremony with his class, he experienced prom, he experienced everyone else that everyone else did. Um, but from the age of 18 to 22, he participated in a transition program. And that transition program was paid by the school district. Hmm. It was for him to be able to obtain all those goals and visions he has from work to um, learning to live on his own. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say living on your own, it, you know, what we talked about before is, you know, being able to cook, to, mm -hmm. to shop, to mm -hmm. bank, um, to do all those steps to have your own living arrangement. And so we had the opportunity through those years from 18 to 22 to have one-to-one -one, uh, uh, support to mm -hmm. do all those different things in his life. Mm -hmm. And through that, he was able to 
spend time with people that had their own apartment, um, who lived in different uh, living arrangements. So um, I, to other family members and other uh, friends and other colleagues, he got to experience uh, what it was like to live in uh, by yourself with a roommate. And these opportunities weren't like for, uh, you know, months and months, but it was given the opportunity once a week for a couple of months to try mm -hmm. it out to again, see where he needed the support and where he could be independent. And we learned a lot through those years that he is a man that uh, is, has few, he says only what he needs to say, hmm. not overly social. He likes to be with one people, but does not like to be in, in large group settings. Mm -hmm. He keeps to himself. Um, so we knew that maybe living completely alone might not be the best idea. It, he would not be coming out of his shell, but one roommate may be a good opportunity. And I think that led us on that journey and where he is today and has one roommate. Mm. And, and you mentioned that program, the transitional program. So did they, did they pay for the experimentation or was, just, was it just recommendations that you acted on? Um, it was a combination. They paid, okay. paid for all the opportunities to learn how to bank, to do chores, to go shopping, um, to make dinner. Um, mm -hmm. So at that time, Craig and I were living in an apartment uh, by ourselves. I, we were, I had gone through a divorce and I would spend time away from the apartment so that Craig had the experience of having his apartment, inviting people over, um, preparing dinner, serving um, doing laundry, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, shopping. So he mm -hmm. would have shopping with staff, scout uh, recipes, uh, do cleaning, cleaning again, not only his room, but the entire apartment. Uh, mm -hmm. The slave driver, but uh, he really needed to learn all these different steps. Right. And so that gave him the opportunity. And most of those were just natural occurrences when he spent time with others mm. and learning how to live, you know, whether they lived in there by themselves or with a roommate, those were connections that we were able to make either myself or friends of mine um, mm. or the, the, the program called Building Futures, which was a transition program. You know, they were able to have this gentleman right here in the picture with Craig uh, they ended up meeting each other when they were both in this transition program. And so they had the opportunity to become friends. And this is one opportunity where they were on vacation together. Mm -hmm. um, they, did, of course, did have uh, some support staff, or actually one woman, but they had a grand time down in uh, Times Square for, you know, uh, three or four days and were able to go see, uh, you know, Broadway shows and so forth. And it just feels so good to see him and his friend having such a such a wonderful wonderful experience without mom and dad. Yeah, right. Um, so the um, the current living arrangement. Tell us a little bit about the level of support he has right now, and touch on you know the the different funding sources that you use, and what kind of support he needs and how, you know, how many hours a day, that kind of stuff. So again, um, everyone is unique and I think it's important mm -hmm. to um, see how independent a person can be. When we were living in our apartment, I would not only have staff support him in that apartment when I wasn't there, but I began leaving him home alone. Mm. And it, it started very slowly where it would be a short amount of time. And it built up before he moved into this home that he lives with his roommate to be uh, anywhere from to two to three hours alone. And he was, you know, again, most times fine. Um, but there is always some level of risk, I think, involved in life. Mm -hmm. And with those risks, I knew that I had to give him those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, was he wonderful every single time? No. Mm -hmm. um, I would come home sometimes and, and he, I could tell that he might have been into eating stuff he shouldn't have been eating or, uh, you know, uh, attempting to 
to um, do something in the microwave, leaving it on too long. I, I wanted him to have risk, but I didn't want him to be hurt. Mm -hmm. so it was something that we built upon to see what level of independence he could have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you start working with estate agencies, developmental services, they have their own rules and regulations that are put in place to protect everyone. And, and I say that because in his living arrangement, uh, he is supported um, 24 hours a day. Mm. And one of the reasons why is because of his, um, his, his inability to leave for fire drills. Mm. Um, so he chooses not to pay attention to them, mm. chooses not to leave when they occur. Mm. And regulations are when you're living in your own place, if you're not able to evacuate within a certain amount of time, the state doesn't want to have the risk of somebody being injured. Makes sense. With that being said, uh, staff person with him the entire time, most staff are uh, downstairs. Uh, they are, you know, uh, doing different tasks around the home. Um, so Craig has a lot of time away from others where he is a left alone, mm. which is something he prefers to do, especially in the early evening. Mm. He want to be bothered after dinner, mm -hmm. spend his time playing, you know, on, you know, PlayStation 4 and, and uh, um, watching different movies of his interests. So it's enabled him to get the support he needs, mm -hmm. not have somebody attached to him one-to-one. Um, and I think it's really helped that he's had this home where it's a different level so that he does not have to be in like a small one bedroom apartment where he would be uh, with staff at all times. Um, it's, we did try that out in the very beginning, having Craig uh, live downstairs and have more support from staff. And his way of telling us that he preferred not to do that was doing such things as when they went out to empty the garbage, locking him out of the house. Uh, <laughs> if they went down to do any laundry in the basement, he locked them down the basement. Um, so he, he tells us in his own way that he really doesn't want to have uh, somebody attached to his hip. Right. In that way, even when he was in school, he used to do all kinds of things to the one-to-one -one aides, which I, I still laugh at. And, uh, you know, it was his way of uh, showing us and showing the world that uh, he didn't want somebody with him 24-7. Right. So um, these people who are, you said 24 hours, they are actually available. And you mentioned they're downstairs. So does is he sharing them with the person downstairs or how is that working? It's a combination. And when I say that, because many families just say, how did you get to where you are today? Mm -hmm. you say about the Department of Developmental Services, his funding is not completely from them. What mm -hmm. we do is we had to develop, um, you know, our our plan for the future and how we would get there, I knew it wouldn't be from one funding source. Mm. I knew that we had to look at everything that we could for Craig. We're not mm. family, we're not, you know, mm -hmm. wealthy where we can hire people on our own. So I really had to look at what we could do within our, our system mm -hmm. and to get him where he is. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, you know, Craig does receive some hours through the Department of Developmental Services but we also use all of his PCA hours. Mm. And um, those PCA hours enable him to have the supports he needs. Mm. Does share some of the hours with his roommate. Um, most of the time, those hours that are shared, we looked at his, you know, their, their lives, a regular life. And we found for those two to share hours, it made sense to do it the early evening shift. I say shift because someone will come in around three o'clock and they stay until someone comes to sleep over. Hmm. And they, the, the, that uh, particular area of their life, they're able, they're home, they're having dinner, they're spending time after dinner, you know, maybe at the concert across the way or, or outside or up in his room. So they're able to share one staff. But it was very clear to us that during the day from like the time in the morning until the, you know, dinner time, um, that they, he and his roommate have no, none of the same interests. Mm. So they spend time together one-to-one -to -one mm. with each other. Uh, they really prefer to be separated and doing their own thing because they have different interests. Mm -hmm. It's okay. 
you know, mm-hmm. hey, that's okay. Because I recall when I was growing up at the age of 18, I left my home mm-hmm. and I tried out different living arrangements. I lived alone. I lived with the roommates and some roommates I was really close to and others right in the night. <laughs> yeah, I know. And um, so that's, that's what he does. The, um, uh, so you you mentioned, I remember when we talked earlier, you mentioned, mentioned section eight and SSI as being some other resources you used, right? Is that still accurate? Yes, there is. And at the end of this presentation, I'll show you a couple of things I developed on our um, looking back on our journey and and how and where we were able to get all the resources. Okay. Um, Somebody has asked, what are PCA hours? You just mentioned PCA hours. PCA hours are personal care attendant hours. And those hours are determined in um, from agencies that come out and do evaluations on individuals. Um, the one thing that you need to have at that time is mass health. Mm-hmm. And at the age of 18, and I'll show you at the end, we did apply for um, social security, supplemental mm-hmm. security income for Greg. And at 18, it was only based on his income and he, he always has worked very part-time and due to his disability qualified. So with that comes mass health mm-hmm. paid. And with that form of insurance, we were able to apply for personal care attendant hours. And it's the, the evaluation consists of um, what help he needs in, in, in his area of uh, daily living. So how, does he need help taking a shower? Does he need help um, doing laundry? Does he need help preparing his meals? Does he need help shopping? Does he need help going to doctor's appointments? And with all those different areas of needs, it's calculated which then equates to hours mm-hmm. that offered um, at Craig in a surrogate. And at, at the time when he first started, I was a surrogate. I no longer am. I actually have a, uh, um, a director of the uh, residential program that's a surrogate. Um, you're, you hire your own staff mm-hmm. and those staff people then are uh, performing and helping you on all the daily living skills you need to do. Mm-hmm. Now, does he drive to work or is he getting help driving, getting places? He does not drive. Uh, again, he um, is probably not at the level of being a driver. Mm-hmm. Um, he does, uh, because he does go to work and he does have what's called support employment. He has a job coach with him uh, to make sure he t- stays on task, that he completes his work. Mm-hmm. Um, that he he doesn't decide to like uh, want, which at times he can. Um, so that person actually transports him there and back. Mm-hmm. Um, that we do in many cities do. Um, we do have just in our city area, which is New Bedford, a um, um, a transportation called um, demand response that would pick a person up from their home and bring them to work or doctor's appointments at back. Um, but it's, it's very um, unpredictable in our area. Um, when I say that, when we lived in Marion, there is no transportation a few towns over. So it depends on where you live to look mm. means of transportation besides yourself or a staff person. Um, as I said, many cities will have a transportation company that can work with, again, people with disability. Mm. So, uh... How how have you, because I hear a lot about the dearth of um, actually skilled workforce um, supporting people. So um, how do you, what has your experience been in retaining staff? Has he experienced turnover or have they pretty much been constant? Both. I would say both. You know, he's had a mm. um, turnover where he might have a staff member that comes in and it just doesn't connect Mm. um, for him or the staff person. Um, He's had some staff people that have been there maybe a year, maybe, maybe two. And he's had others that have been there right now. Currently he's with one woman that he has been supported by um, her and she's been a part of his life Mm. for um, 15 years. Wow. And he has a, 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 a young man, much more his age, who is going on five years with him. 
so I see. It, it's got to be that right connection. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you'll go for years without finding that, and other times you'll find them right away. Mm. And when I, you know, retaining staff, I think is also a something that we'll always face in, I think, in the human service world. Um, it's a lot of work. We know that as parents. Yep. And, um, you know, what can we do to retain the staff that are good? You know, I do make, try to make a personal connection so that they know how valued they are. Mm -hmm. um, I try to, you know, acknowledge when they do something well. Uh, thank you notes, birthdays, uh, Christmases, nothing huge. Again, I'm not rich, but I want to acknowledge that they yep. mean so much to us and have made such a difference for Craig. Mm, awesome. Um, so tell me, you mentioned vision and person-centered planning. So tell us a little bit about that process and uh, you know how, what role that played in the current arrangement. I can't say important that was for our family. And the, the, you know, the key to that is really, again, not being the vision of just mom and dad. This is the vision of uh, Craig, uh, extended family, friends, even people that m may not be close friends to Craig. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say that is, you know, some of his person center planning uh, would occur. It started when he was in second grade, then we never did another one until he was in junior high. And then when he was in high school, and then um, we didn't do another one until maybe a couple of years ago. So it's really dependent on where you are in that life cycle and when it's necessary. And I say that, so I would find where we were stuck somewhere. So this is an example of a, a picture of some of his artwork that he does. He's a photographer as well. Mm -hmm. That came from person-centered planning. Mm -hmm. Other people noticed that he had a knack for taking pictures. And through that knack, um, uh, when he was in high school, um, we began exploring post-secondary education and where that could go for Craig. And um, one of the first classes we thought would be wonderful for him to try out would be photography. And, uh, you know, he, he is, you know, been doing it now for years, not every year, but, you know, every mm -hmm. the year or every two years, he'll reach out to uh, people that are in his circle, his family, the people that are involved and give us uh, the information that he wants to take a class again. Um, he's sold at local fairs. He's um, art show where he won an award, which is just based on other students looking at artwork, not knowing who that awesome. photographer is. So, you know, this, these are different opportunities through person center planning that's given him the opportunity to uh, continue on his vision. Mm. And through that vision, it was also found out just as most, I think, young teenagers maybe 17, 18, are thinking about what do you do when you leave school? You know, do you want to live with mom and dad the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. Want to go on to, to a college? Do you want to go on to having a job? Um, and this is where his journey led him to where he is today. You know, he did. He expressed he didn't want to live with us forever. And uh, that gave us the opportunity to move forward and try out these different opportunities. The um, so speaking of forever and and then future, right? So, what are your and Craig's? Have you thought about the future plans and what is going to kind of be in place for him? Because you're not going to live forever. So, what's how do how how's that process um, going to be um, guided? Um, you know where we are today, and I say today because it, it may change in another five or 10 years, is that um, he does not want to live with family. He wants to have a home of his own. Hmm. Um, you know, he wants to um, have the ability to make more of his own decisions. Um, you know, when he was 18, again, some families will look at uh, different aspects of life, such as guardianship, Mm -hmm. and support decision-making. 
at that time, there was no no such thing as supported decision making, but I, we felt as a family that we wanted to give Craig the opportunity decisions. And how do you do that? One way is not taking guardianship because I felt it was important for him to learn mm -hmm. the different things in his life he's going to have to make decisions on because I'm not going to be there forever. Um, you know, but he needed to have support doing that. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, I, I would say even my daughters at 18, they didn't always make the best decisions, but I knew that they, they could talk to others and learn and be able to uh, usually manage it. With Craig, he has had more opportunity to learn. Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, financial or, or even, you know, his medical needs, he's got to be actively involved. He has to be supported to learn about it and know about it so that he can make a decision on it. Mm. You have to honor that. Um, and, and when I say we have to honor it, there's sometimes he makes a decision that I don't like. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as long as uh, we can, we know that he's being supported to make that decision and is kept in the, the ability of not being actually hurt, mm -hmm. um, we feel that he has to take some of those risks. And one of those risks is, you know, where are you going to be in the future? Mm -hmm. If not here and dad's not here, um, you know, he does not want to live with his sisters. Mm -hmm. They they will even say, do you want to sleep over? And he says no. So that's a clear definition. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that he just does. He wants his own. Mm -hmm. And so estate planning was something we had begun years ago when he was actually in kindergarten. Mm -hmm and uh, looking for the future and, and uh, making sure that there's always somebody in his life to help him. Mm. That's where we th see the future for Craig. I see him living probably in a similar type of situation when he's older. Mm -hmm. He has to live with a roommate, mm -hmm. a girlfriend, who knows what the future will hold. Mm -hmm. And I see him having his own life, but still having family part as he is here, he's an uncle, mm. you know, he is a brother, he is a uh, neighbor, mm -hmm. you know, all these valued roles in his life and he wants to have those valued roles. Um, and he should be given that opportunity. Mm. I don't want my daughters thinking that they have to take him in when I'm gone. Mm. Um, you know, that's something we've taught to uh, as a family for many years. Mm -hmm. Part of your brother's life because he's your brother, as he is part of your life because you're his sister. Um, mm -hmm. Don't expect them to take over. He needs to have his own independence, his own um, ability to have choice, his own ability to uh, make decisions. Mm -hmm. And we just need to help help him and help him learn it and experience and, and get all the information he needs to make those choices. So to that end, somebody's asked, how do you manage the staff if parents are not able to manage anymore? Again, it's a key is to make sure that, that your, your loved one is, their voice is being heard, even if they don't have a voice. And when I say that is Craig is a man of few words because he also has articulation issues. Um, you know, he had uh, many years without a voice with uh, his trichostomy. And um, so it's really people that are close to him that know him, including, you know, family members and close friends that know when he's happy and when he's not. Mm. He's the indicator. I don't need to interview staff. I don't need to be part of their everyday lives. It matters on who Craig and how Craig is mm. is the indicator whether it's working or not. Mm. So you're you're thinking that there will be some support, like like a support circle in place, for even past your time. Yes. To, to help him with that. Yes. Um, and somebody's asked, what are surrogates? Because you mentioned that you were a surrogate. A surrogate is somebody that's responsible when a person is given a personal care attendant hours mm. to uh, make sure that the uh, staff uh, show up, that their, their time sheets are completed, that they're sent in. More of the um, fiscal areas mm. needs um, mm. or that uh, yearly assessments are, are done that you um, allow the nurse or occupational therapist to come in to do an evaluation. And so um, there is a surrogate when you have personal care attendant hours. Mm. Typically they don't, and it, but it's not un, unheard of that a person receiving 
those services could be their own surrogate. Mm. Um, you know, for for Craig and where he is, because he has a combination of um, funding from mm -hmm. developmental services, personal care, attendant hours, and even, you know, family and friends spending some time with them. It made more sense as uh, he he continued his journey to have a, uh, uh, a staff member from an agency take over that surrogacy mm. to make sure that all those fiscal things are done. Mm. So I'm not part of his everyday scheduling. Mm. Um, you know, it's not my business to be part of the everyday scheduling. Mm. Uh, you know, that's just another way for Craig to have more of his voice heard where he, who's coming, who was staff are there. So it's not a paid position. No. No. Okay. Um, and then I have another question, um, which is not really housing related, but uh, what type of agency is supporting him in his job and job coach? Is it through an adult day program? And if so, how is that funded? Yes, it's through an adult agency and it's funded through the Department of Developmental Services that supported employment part. Um, at the age of 22, you, uh, it, again, for Craig and his disability, his lead agency is the Par Department of Developmental Services. Mm -hmm. And through that, um, you know, he at that time at, at the age of 22 was still living in a family home and he was given turning 22 funding and that funding was to work toward uh, employment because that was a key for him to move on to the next step, maybe eventually moving out. Mm. Um, so that he was given an allocation and that allocation was uh, provided through an agency and the goals were to obtain employment um with the support of a of a job coach and eventually be able to a coach who could fade out to get more independence craig has had those opportunities through the years where he's needed less job coaching um but there for craig's area of need he's a job coaching with him at all times okay and um Will DDS service before age 22 uh, if high school GED is attained? That's the question I'm reading out loud. I'm not quite sure I understand. Will I, DDS, I, okay. I think yeah. I understand a bit because, you know, the department is here in Massachusetts, um, probably about, uh, probably now, 10 years ago, became the lead agency for uh, Prater Willie, uh, if you have a uh, diagnosis of Prater Willie, if you have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. any individuals don't stay in to, and get the school department until they're 22. Some individuals will and, and have completed all the requirements to graduate mm -hmm. or, you know, decide to um, get a GED before the age of 22. And I think they're asking, can you get funding from a state agency at that time? Mm -hmm. And again, depending on um, the level of need. So I work with many families that the individual is 18, they have a diagnosis of autism, um, that they are able to get some funding at the age of 18. But typically if you're under intellectual disability under the department, the funding doesn't kick in until 22. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we are officially in the Q&A time, but do you want to share the that that list you created? Um, I would love to. Okay. So again, these are just some of the these are some of yeah. the app that I was talking about as well. That's his man cave over in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and to leave you, this is his home. Um, this is you know it's in, in a wonderful area. It's actually a uh, historical home. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's also quite exciting, I think, because it's every typical neighborhood. Mm. How did you find it? Excuse me? How did you find the house? Uh, I, I, it's through, actually, his roommate had been living there before mm. with an older woman. And um, uh, the, uh, her, her name was Maggie. She was a beautiful woman. Um, she passed away. And so the opportunity happened through that. Um, unfortunate circumstance, but I have to say Maggie had a wonderful life. She lived into her late 80s when she passed and never left her home. Um, and so that opportunity came about because 
of the, being the right time, the right place for Craig. And it was when I, we first looked and found this as, as an opportunity to have a roommate for who was still living there, Michael, um, I was hesitant at first because I, I knew that Craig and Michael didn't have a lot in common. Um, but I also knew that for Craig, he wanted to give it a, a try. Mm -hmm. And years later, it's working. <laughs> yeah. And, and were you like it, it going through some uh, like ads or something to find the place or how, was it personal networking? Personal uh, networking. Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so this is not, the, I want to emphasize, this is not a group home situation. This is, um, this is independent you know, is maintained. And this is based on the person-centered planning you alluded to uh, before, which is making sure Craig is living on his terms, right? Yes. Because we don't want to confuse this with a group home situation. This is independent living funded yes. with support, you know, with support funded by other sources, yes. right? It okay. is. And, uh, you know, again, it's, and there's different circumstances and different choices that uh, individuals and families make. I'm not saying that one's better than the other, but this is the root and the vision that we had and mm -hmm. I had. Um, you know, I, I say it really starts out with person-centered planning. You need to have a vision. And of course, when they're much younger, that vision's more developed through the family, more, you know, through um, people that have had more experience. Um, and, but it's really key to get that person involved at, I felt, I feel at the age of 14, mm -hmm. 14 at the latest. And when I say that Craig attended every team meeting he had, he does to this day. Now it's adult services, but it's his meeting. It's his life. Um, he needs to be part of it. He needs to know what's happening. Does he know every nuance that's going on in those meetings? Of course not. Mm. Does he know the basics of what's happening? Is he part of the conversation? Is he given the opportunity to sort of direct things in his way that he can? Yes. And mm -hmm. the key is to empower them to have power to make choice. Mm -hmm. So um, that journey began at the age of 14 and it, it began when he was in school. We focused on a vision it, and it, these are, uh, these steps are a few of the things that he had goals on in his IEP, mm -hmm. um, giving him the opportunity to try uh, college classes while the school department was still paying for services, job sampling, uh, you know, learning these basic skills after school. So he was never taken out of the school. When he was in, in class, he was fully included. Um, and then I looked at what do other kids do at the age of 17? After school, they have jobs. They do chores. Um, you know, I remember my mother making me do the laundry and cooking when I was 16 and 17. These are things I wanted Craig to do as well. I did not want it to take out of his uh, typical life. So I made sure that I thought of things such as what do other kids do at that particular age? At the age of 17 and a half to 18, there are some things that I think are very important to know that you need to maybe take that step. So hold on, Sandy. Are you sharing that document? Because uh, I am. It didn't work. No. Oh, sorry. It says it's pause. I apologize. Resume share. Oh no, that's not it. Let's see. Get it for you. And we can um, try and send the document too after with the recording. Um, so. All right. Let me see. I can find it for you guys. You see anything yet? Nope. No. Uh, let me see if I can share. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Let me have it open. Sorry about this, guys. Yeah, and I'm going to try and be quick because I know we have about five minutes left. Um, so let me just share it real quick. Give me a minute here. Or if, hold on. Um, there we go. Okay, do you see it? Yay! 
Yay. Awesome. Yeah. So you're going to have to run through this because we basically have five minutes. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> so again, um, because I think you have control over that. Maybe scroll. Oh, okay. Okay. Scroll down. There we go. And we my... will share this at the end. And yes. We will no share it with the recording. Yeah. Um, so the age of 17 and a half to 18, there's some key things I think families really need to learn and decide whether these are the route you want to take. Um, one of the things is a psychological evaluation is required um, for such things as Social Security, if you're going to apply for Social Security, if you're uh, looking for the Department of Developmental Services. These are all things that are going to be required when you're completing these applications. I say that because I never had a psychological done on Craig until he was 18 because I never felt it was going to give us any more information than we already knew. Um, it's completing adult eligibility, in particular to the Department of Developmental Services. At the age of 18, you have to be uh, deemed eligible for adult services. Um, many families think, oh, well, my child was eligible, so it just continues, and it doesn't. You need to see what state agency and what they require for adult services. With that said, there are other state agencies that can also help. You know, Craig was and does receive Department of Developmental Services, but he also um, received services through Mass Rehab Commission, and that helped with getting him um, job samples, trying out different jobs, and it can help with post-secondary education as well. Uh, we research supported decision making. Um, again, uh, we uh, did go with that, and we have a healthcare proxy and power of attorney. Craig makes his own decisions with the supporters. He wants to help him in different parts of his life. Other families, I would say, you look at guardianship, partial, full, um, estate planning is, is again, a, a wonderful tool. Um, and some of those estate planning could help with a special needs trust or ABLE account if, if you have, um, uh, you know, money being left or resources, you want to protect some of these areas because they can affect the Social Security as well in the future. At the age of 18, we applied for a supplemental security income. And it's important to know that you're just reporting the income of the, the person themselves, the child. Um, and if not approved for SSI, you know, you might have to apply separately for Medicaid to receive services such as PCA services. You need to have Medicaid as a form of insurance. And the, this is key in that it's amazing to many people, but it, it's so true. Submit Section 8 voucher at the age of 18. Even if you or your, your loved one is not ready to go on to move in another location, and I say that because there are three different types. One is Section 8, which is federally covers anywheres in the United States. We have Section 8 that covers anywheres in the state of Massachusetts. And you have local city and town housing authorities that just cover that particular housing units in those areas. Uh, but they take a long time. And when like I- 10 years sometimes, right? Oh, years. So yeah. at 18, I, I put Craig on the list and he received his Section 8 five years ago. And you only uh, submit for one of those or all three of those? And you could, you could submit for all three in whichever came up first, look to see whether you were ready to go. Okay. Um, but if you're not uh, ready to go and you want to, you know, you're going to look at a vision down the line, you may look for the Section 8 voucher. I think it encompasses so much more where they can move anywhere in the United States. It could even be used for many towns and cities are looking at um, giving the opportunity for families to, uh, to build a like in-law apartment for their loved one. And it could cover the cost of uh, that uh, portion of rent. Mm -hmm. uh, again, my son is not rich. He, he, his income is SSI and his 10 to 15 hours of work per week. Mm -hmm. um, so Section 8 is vital for him to have his own place and be mm -hmm. live in a, in, a, in a home that he's living in and, mm -hmm. and get that funding. Um, if, if you haven't completed yet, applying for personal care attendant hours. Um, at 18 to 20, it's really focusing on your transition goals. There is a uh, transition um, 
uh, plan that's attached to your IEP, that vision and those goals should really focus on where you see your loved one in the future, mm. your loved one be part of that future. You know, I could not decide on going to college for Craig unless Craig wanted to go to college. And that's true of me. No one's going to tell me what to do unless I really mm -hmm. want to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's really key to see how you can have your loved one involved. Um, wh where do we apply for PCA hours? Um, there are various agencies of the state, and usually they're, they're located within your, uh, where you live. Um, so when I say that, you can actually Google uh, personal care attendant hours, and you can mm. you live. And you'll probably come up with at least four to five different agencies that um, hold those contracts that will come and do an evaluation. And these are um, state agencies? State agencies, are, they're funded through um, Medicaid usually. Okay. Um, Tempest, uh, in our area, we have uh, South Shore Arc, Metro West. These are different agencies that hold these contracts. Okay. And then there are additional funding sources to think of. You know, if you're thinking about the future and looking at an in-law apartment, you might look at a home modification loan. If you own your home and need some uh, funding to help build that. Um, if you're 22, there's Catastrophic Illness and Children Relief Fund. There are community grants um, in your local cities and towns. United Way is very useful in finding out any type of grants that might be available. And this is one that's in our area called the Phillips Foundation. And again, these are ways for you to achieve the vision, knowing that not many of us don't have the actual funding to support everything. Where do we get those help, the help from? Mm -hmm. And again, vision, plan, and, and create a non-negotiable list, things you are not willing to compromise or that your loved one's not willing to compromise. I know with Craig, and it's nothing against group homes, but where our non-negotiable is that he will never live in a group home because that's not a area he wants to do. Mm -hmm. The next slide will show you some different housing options. Living alone in a home or apartment, living with a roommate with a disability, without a disability, living with family, adult family care, living in another family's home, shared living. These are all different terms you're going to hear. And living in a group home. And there are pros and cons to all of these options. And these are just a few of those um, areas. So living alone can cost, uh, would cost the most and most individuals really need something like a section eight. Uh, living with a roommate without a disability, you might need to look at reducing that person's rent or no rent for them to uh, offer support to your loved one. Living with a family, you know, individuals don't experience living away from their caregivers and our caregivers get older and can't support them the way we used to. Living with another family, um, it, you, it may be good for a period of time, but a lot of times they move on. Um, and so that living arrangement may not last forever. Uh, living with a roommate with a disability, you know, are they compatible or if they're not, can they still live in that same household and manage? Living in a group home, it's, you usually need to find a group home that is a bed open and you usually don't have a choice of who you're living with and who the staff are. It's very much directed by the agency. But I've heard that they're not building any more group homes, right? In they are not. So yeah. it's really, it's a matter of looking for the ones that exist and whether or not there's a bed open. Okay. So uh, we will share this document, um, you know, once uh, we're done, you know, with the webinar. I mean, not right away, but uh, when we send the re recording, we will share it. Um, Sandy, I, what is your email or how, if people want to contact you, can they contact you and uh, where, how would they do that? Sure. Uh, you're free to contact me for any information. Um, and I can, uh, you can ch chat it on your, if you can, if not, not, I will add it to the document and send it. I will send it now on chat and it's, um, Sandy Kinney. That's my, uh, was my Mary name. I never, uh, I went back to my maiden name when I divorced, but I never changed my email. Uh, so <laughs> it's at Sandy Kinney at Namaska group.org is the easiest way for to get a hold of me. Um, and I also can uh, uh, leave you with a uh, phone number. You can always reach me here as well um, at Namaskit most days and most times.
And I can give you that phone number if anyone ever needs to get a hold of me. And I'll be happy to um, um, share resources, information, um, you know, never be hesitant about reaching out. I think the more we network, the more we talk to each other, mm -hmm. the more information everybody has, the better decisions people can make, not only ourselves, but our loved ones in particular. Um, that's great, Sandy. Uh, thank you so much for um, making yourself available and um, also for this great information. We went over by more than five minutes, uh, but it, it was all great. And um, I got to all the um, questions, I, I think, um, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Um, but the other thing is I have included a link to the post webinar survey. We really would love to hear from you um, if there's stuff that we can do better, um, getting your feedback, if there are other topics, um, just would love to hear from you and your feedback. Um, so I've included, chatted that link um, on the chat box. So please feel free to use it and give us your feedback. So thank you MFOFC again for this opportunity to share your insights. And thank you so much, Sandy, again, for your time. And thank, thank you all for coming. And attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.